let's destroy some stuff. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Chaos Destruction and how we can use that to, there we go, destroy meshes like this in real time. And it's really quite cool and actually remarkably easy to set up. So let's get started. I'm here in an entirely empty project. We're going to set up a explosion actor and we're going to be setting up the actual destructible mesh. If you want the project files, it's fairly easy what we're going to be doing here today, but I will still be a download link down below in the description for YouTube members and patrons to download the project files if you want to take a look into them. Now, first and foremost, what we should do is just go into modeling mode real quick, and I'm just going to add in a little cube here. And once we have that cube, uh, let's just like make it a little bit bigger and we'll just add a little bit more definition to this in some way. So let's go into polygroup edit and this doesn't really matter. I'm just going to real quick go through this. And we have something in a shape that we can work with. At least it's a little bit more interesting than just a cube, right? So let's put this into the world real quick. And now we're going to go ahead and make this a chaos destructible mesh. So coming up here into the top left corner, what we'll do is we go into the fracture workspace, which you can do with shift six as well. Now in here, what we do uh, first and foremost is we create a new geometry collection asset, And that's just going to create your geometry collection asset, which is just the settings for how this geometry collection or this destructible mesh should work. So we need to do that, and that then transforms this into a destructible mesh. We can open up this asset if we really want to, and uh, there will be a couple of settings to look into. So we've got a cluster group index, mass cluster, maximum cluster level. Uh, all of this is really not that important. Uh, what you maybe want to change is the mass. This is the, well, the mass of the object as a whole. So that might be a value that you uh, do want to change. You can also uh, change its physics material to other physics materials. All of that is done within this asset and that is for this one specific destructible mesh. And of course we can uh, instance that a bunch of times uh, by just dragging it into the scene uh, like this as you want. Uh, but we're going to just do it with the original one here. So how do we now make this destructible? Because it's just one mesh now still. Well let's go over here into the fracture settings. There's a lot of other settings that we can play with here. I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, ones here. So the probably the most common one that you're going to be using will be the uniform. And this will use a 3D uh, Voronoi texture to make clusters or chunks out of uh, your mesh. So you can kind of see them right here. If you want to see them a little bit more clearly, we have the explode amount here. And once we apply this fracture, uh, you can see that now actually we have all these differently colored uh, segments as well. If we increase the explode amount, it actually shows you every single bit of the model uh, individually. And the fun part is, once you have these individual bits, you can actually select them one by one. You have this whole hierarchy here on the right hand side now, uh, which is each individual single segment as well. And you can also then subdivide these uh, some more. So if I want specifically this one, I'm like, this is a little bit big, I don't really like it. I can specifically fracture this one and look over the right hand side what happens here, right? That number 10 then becomes a parent to like number 26 through like 40 something, meaning that we now have a bunch of fractures within that one fractured piece. And then of course we can take any one of these individually fractured pieces and if we really wanted to we can fracture it over and over and over and over again. You probably don't want to uh, get stuck too deep <laughs> into that. Uh, I did it one more time here and you can see how tiny these pieces uh, start to get really really quickly. So you can nest this over and over and over and over again if you want to. Now let's reset this actually. Uh, we can, if we just select the top level one uh, and we reset, we get rid of all of our fractures and we can make a new one. Because if you want something smaller, you don't need to go through one by one and refracture all the individual fractured pieces. You can just say the minimum amount of uh, Voronoi things that you want, so that would be like 10, and the maximum amount would be like 60. And if we then try to fracture with this, you will be able to see that it has a bunch more different objects. So 64 in total now, versus uh, when this was 20 and 20, they were all much bigger chunks. But of course, we also have our clusters, 
which uh, behaves so slightly differently and has a lot more things that you can play with, the uh, size of the clusters and whatever. Uh, we've got this radial, which cuts the mesh up in a shape in the middle. In this case, that would be like with four edges. You can say like with 10 edges. And then from that, it just goes out to the sides uh, and this can be nice in certain scenarios, I guess. And one of the more useful ones is a brick texture. And it's a little hard to see here, uh, but this will slice the thing up in uh, bricks, which can be uh, kind of nice. You can set the brick length to whatever you want it to be, and then set the brick height to whatever you want it to be, and then even the brick depth can be a little bit lower. And now we've got like a bunch of little bricks uh, that it's going to get split up onto. So let's actually use that one, fracture, and you can see it changes into a bunch of tiny little bricks. And if we then set the explode amount back to zero, that is just our original model, which is really, really quite cool. So that's the basic idea here of fracturing the initial mesh into a destructible mesh. Now let's go back into selection mode. And in here, you might be saying, eh, there's, there's an issue here. Uh, why is this thing suddenly all colorful? And that is because we have a option enabled called show bone colors. As just for debugging purposes. If we disable that, you can see it just uses the original textures and the original UVs again. And now, just for demonstration purposes, if I uh, drop this from a certain height, it should break apart into its many different pieces. As you can see, that wasn't actually quite enough of a drop to properly break it down, it seems like. Uh, but it's there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. So it can sometimes explode a little weirdly. Uh, if one of these little bricks moves around due to it being broken apart and then it moves back into the original mesh that can then create a new bit of pressure which then fractures the thing more which makes more bricks appear and so on and so forth so it can be a little like self-fulfilling a little buggy you can see that this thing is just bouncing on its broken off parts and that is then breaking off more parts uh, so that's maybe not ideal uh, in all scenarios <laughs> that is kind of a uh, part of the issue with using the bricks layout because of the way that the bricks are so uniformly shaped that kind of thing that does happen a little bit easier if we just reset this and we go back to uh, uniform and we just increase this oh not that much maybe and we just increase these values a little bit more to the point where there, there will be a fair bit of different chunks here uh, they won't be as uniform in shape and that'll actually end up uh, working out a little bit better so this has got 750 uh, individual shapes now and if we then also like maybe make it fall on one of its edges it's going to explode a little bit more cleanly presumably so there we go you can see that these like rock formations are breaking off of it which is kind of nice but this is entirely just due to gravity and i don't think that that is probably what you're looking for uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to make an explosion actor an actor that lets you uh, cause an explosion that chaos destruction will respond to so let's go into our content folder here and we have a blueprint actor and i will just call this something like bomb and in here we need to add a couple of different components the first of which is going to be a field system component so that it can work with field systems and field systems are things that just kind of impact chaos destruction objects and then on begin play let's just simply spawn a niagara system uh, attached to this thing and the system that will spawn in will be the simple explosion sample and we will attach that to the default scene route in this case uh, a little unrelated tip that i have for you right here because this is going to be a thing that just like spawns in its particles does its physics things and then needs to disappear again you have a Niagara system here. Uh, what you can actually do is you can assign system finished and that will get you an event that will just run when the system itself is finished. We can set this to auto destroy, but that doesn't really matter uh, because we can then destroy the entire actor once the system has uh, finished playing, which is quite nice. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about here today. What we're going to be talking about is our field system. So let's drag that in and we can add a persistent field. There's a couple of different types of fields that you can add today. Let's just go for the persistent ones. It's the easiest to work with. And we will enable that field. Then we've got a couple of different physics types that we can work with. Uh, we've got a dynamic state, linear force, external strain, kill particle, linear velocity, angular velocity, angular torque, internal strain, disabled threshold, sleeping threshold, collision group, and activate disabled. 
That is a lot of stuff to look at. We're going to just look at two of them uh, for today. And the most important one is going to be, for now, external strain. This is a force that you apply to each individual bit of the Chaos Destruction mesh to see whether or not it should break away from the rest of the mesh. So normal physics impulses don't really have that impact on it. It's specifically the external strain value that you're looking into that applies to a destructible mesh and breaks it apart into its individual pieces. Uh, there's a couple of things that we can do here. Inserting metadata, we're just going to skip over that for now. Let's just keep it simple. And then we have a field node. This is the area of which the field, in this case, the external strain is going to get applied to. And for that, we're going to need another component. And that will be a radial fall off component. And if we just pull that in here, there's a couple of things that we can do. We can just set up the values in here very, very easily, like the field magnitude, the uh, minimum and maximum range, default value and sphere radius and its center position, and then its fall off type. Uh, but if you want to set these programmatically, you can set them individually, but you can also just uh, set radial fall off and we get this green uh, blueprint pure function and that just gets you all those values as well and gets you a return value that you can just put into the field node here which that makes it a little bit easier just having everything in your blueprint graph as well as if you want to set anything programmatically uh, that will be needed such as the center position we're going to want the center position to always be the actor location of course so we just plug it in there and then the sphere radius uh, we can do whatever you want with that uh, you could potentially make this a variable that is exposed on spawn so whenever you spawn one of these things in you can give it a variable amount of radius that it affects something like that right so uh, we can easily promote this to a variable uh, let's compile this give it a default value of like uh, 1200 or something like that that's quite big maybe but stick with it and if we make that instance editable and exposed on spawn uh, whenever we spawn one of these in uh, we can set that specific spawn to have a different radius which is quite nice now going into our third person character real quick uh, i've just got this uh, third person uh, blueprint template that we're working with here today and i'm going to put in a debug f key and in that we will spawn actor from class and we're going to be spawning in our bomb and as you can see, it has the sphere radius uh, as a field. So if we want, in this specific case, we actually, ah, uh, let's spawn one in with a field radius of 800. We can easily do that. Uh, the spawn transform should just be the get actor transform. So we can plug that into right there. And now it should be as easy as that. And when we spawn in, uh, let's change this to just select a viewport instead. When we spawn in and we walk up to this thing, we press the F key, uh, it will not actually do anything yet and that is because we need to set up the magnitude and we need to know how resilient this specific mesh is so if we go into our geometry collection actor our destructible mesh we have this little thing here called damage and we have got damage threshold. So we've got an index zero of, I think that is 50,000, that might be 500,000, and another one and another one with uh, proceedingly lower values. This is the amount of damage that you need to do to it in order for this thing to start breaking apart. And at the moment, our bomb has a magnitude of one. So it's not actually going to work that well. So probably also I put this as a exposed variable let's say with a default value of like 150,000, something like that. And we also make it instance editable and expose it on spawn, just because if we then go back into here and we refresh this node, we now have this just as an input for spawning that thing in as well, which is quite nice. And hopefully 150,000 is enough to start breaking this thing apart. Uh, maybe it is not. So that clearly was 500,000. So let's just add another zero to this and then it should very much start breaking apart. So let's try again now, and you can see, there we go, it breaks apart. But it only breaks apart, it doesn't actually fly all over the place, it just kind of falls to the ground. And since we're doing an explosion, we're doing like a bomb, uh, that's not really how a bomb should work. Matter of fact, if I ignite the bomb again, the pieces themselves won't actually move anymore. Because the only force that we're applying is a force to break these things apart, not actually to move them. The only reason that they move is because they're no longer part of the hole and then gravity just kind of like pulls them to the floor. So going back into our bomb, uh, we actually need to 
add in a second persistent field here that does something different. So let's add in a persistent field again. And with this one, uh, we need to enable field again. And we're going to, instead of using the external strain, we're going to be setting its linear velocity. So now it will apply a force to try and break these things, but it'll also apply a force to try and move them. How do we set this up though? Because we can't just put this into there. Well, we can, but that won't do anything. For this, we need to have a vector, a radial vector, as a matter of fact. And much the same as we did before, this can just in the details panel, we can give it values, uh, but you can also just set radial vector. And if you then scroll all the way down, you get one of those green nodes. And it's just a little bit easier to work with. Uh, the magnitude for this needs to be significantly lower than the insane values that we set up uh, for this. So do be aware of that. Uh, something like 300, 400, maybe even 500. Let's go for 400 will be plenty enough. And then of course the uh, center position will also be the actor's location itself. And this will now also apply a movement force to all those individual uh, bits. So if we now try to explode this thing, you can see it actually explodes away from us uh, and maybe slightly too powerful <laughs> still. Uh, as you can see there, 400 definitely maybe still too much. So let's do something like 50. It can be a pretty low value, uh, but now you can see that it does blow them kind of all over the place still uh, a little more than i initially actually would expect to be honest with you so that's a little bit better now you can see it's kind of blowing them that way and when i press this button again the things around me uh, will still get a little velocity applied to them as you can see right there now here we get into uh, the assets that we uh, had before, right? This uh, CG box, the destructible mesh asset. Because we're breaking this up into like 700 something pieces and the total mass of this thing is only 2,500, they are quite light individually. So if we don't want these to be blasted all over the place, maybe we want to set the mass of this thing to like 10,000 instead, about four times as high. There's a little bit of trial and error that you're just going to have to uh, play around with. Like right now, uh, it actually just straight up doesn't do that much. So maybe we want that field magnitude to be a little bit higher. I said a little bit lower, that might have been cut from the video. Uh, but now we're up to like a field magnitude of 10, which still isn't that much. This is, again, you're just going to have to find out what a good value is for your particular need. Like right there, that is maybe still a little bit too much. So you can see that even if you go over a little, uh, it can start being a little weird about it. But I think that might have been a pretty good one. Maybe even, I think honestly 10 might have been good. Let's go for 12. So yeah, now you can see that it's definitely like blasting them into that specific direction uh, without them going all over the place. And the reason that this is a problem is because if we only had like 100 chunks that this thing blasts into, each one of those is going to roughly have one one hundredth of the total mass, depending on the size of each chunk, of course. But since we have so many different individual pieces, they all only get a little bit of mass. So that is something to be aware of. Now, there's one more issue that we're going to look into, and that is uh, after we initially like blast this thing apart, which is quite nice, uh, because the radial force, the radial vector that we're applying, applies throughout the entire world. Even if we stand all the way over here, the forces will still apply to all of the rubble, which is maybe not ideal. <laughs> so let's take a look into how to fix that, because it's actually quite easy. Going back into the bomb, uh, we can add one more component here, and that will be a culling field. And that's going to cull where this radial vector force gets applied and where it doesn't. So uh, we pull that in, we set the culling field, again, the green one, and our input field is going to be our radial vector, and our culling field is just going to be our radial falloff. So what this will do is we'll just take our radial vector, which is going to get applied throughout the entire world by default, and kind of just like multiply it with the strength of our radial falloff. So if we have our falloff type even set to like linear or inverse or whatever, that's also going to apply uh, to this radial vector. It's kind of like a mask. And we can just pull that into the culling field, and then the output from the culling field will be the thing that we actually use in the add persistent field node. Last thing to uh, pay attention to is this culling operation. Right now, it's culling everything inside of this radius rather than outside of this radius, which means that it's going to be happening all over the world except in the radius right around uh, where we're culling. So 
we want to set this to outside instead. Now it's going to be happening nowhere except for inside of our column view. And with that, we can explode this thing very, very easily. And then if we walk a little while away uh, from it, our explosions don't actually do anything because we're too far away from it. Now that we're standing a little bit closer again, if we do things, you can see the rubble uh, does get pushed around with our explosion. And that is the basics of setting up destructible meshes with chaos destruction and how to move them around, how to break them up and how the basic IDs work. Again, if you want to play around with this project, again, it's pretty simple. We just made like one little explosion thing. Uh, there is a link down below in the description to Patreon and YouTube members for the specific download for this project file. But I'll be back next time with another video with some more interesting, fun stuff in Unreal. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. A huge thank you to my cave student tier supporters, Earl Monteville Erno, and my cave digger tier supporters, Sergey Thomas,